In these days, a lot of things are happening in the churches and in the wider world remotely because of the coronavirus and its effects. People are not able to meet together. Um, activities, events which were planned long time ago, they had to be cancelled because uh, people are not able to meet together. Uh, but because of the modern technology, we are privileged uh, in many ways. Still, our activities can happen, but totally in a different way. Here in Trikhaul, before the churches were closed down, we started this year Lent course produced by Churches Together in Britain and Ireland, which is written by Dr. Claire Amos. Dr. Claire Amos, who is director for lay discipleship in the Diocese of Europe, she is a great Old Testament scholar and has produced various books. Every year we have a Lent course followed by a Lent lecture. Dr. Claire Amos, as you are aware, is not able to come, but still we will be able to listen what she is saying about the course she produced, opening the scriptures, putting our hearts on fire. Listen what Dr. Amos is saying to us. I'm very sorry that for reasons that are obvious to all of us, I'm not able to be with you in person. And I thank Reverend Rana and Simon Large very much for making the effort to ensure that I can at least share something with you online. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been involved in working with colleagues and friends at the Anglican Church of Holy Trinity, Geneva. That's the Anglican Church where I attend when I'm in Switzerland to ensure that we can hold an online Sunday service by Zoom. It feels a bit strange. My husband and I are actually physically at our house in Dorset, which is where I am at the moment. And yet we are as present with the group organising the services as we would be if we were in Switzerland. However, it's also very moving and helps us to understand something about the real community of the church as the body of Christ throughout the world. One of the things that we've discovered as we've worked on service is together is that when we're doing things online, it's better to be shorter rather than longer, perhaps because of the concentration that's required to work in this way. So I'm deliberately trying to be rather shorter with what I share with you now than I would have been if I'd been with you in person. Rana, originally asked me to speak for 45 minutes if I'd come in the flesh, but I'm aiming now at about 25 minutes. Perhaps one day before too long, I'll have the opportunity to come to Krakow and we can continue the conversation. Inevitably too, the experiences we are going through have impacted on what I'm going to share. I'd find it strange if they didn't. I profoundly believe that what we Christians call the Incarnation lies at the heart of my faith. My belief that in Jesus Christ, God's word became flesh and dwelt among us, and in him we saw God's glory, is at the heart of my theology. And it affects how I see the reality that we are living through in these strange days. God is intimately concerned and involved with our material world. In fact, in recent weeks, I found myself coming back again and again to the themes that I explored in my Lent course. As it turns out, they seem to me to be teasing out the pain and the glory of what it means to be a human being at our present time and in our current situation. In one sense, I've been writing that Lent book all of my life. It shares themes and ideas that have been dear to me for several decades. It also draws quite considerably on my interest in the book of Genesis that I wrote a commentary on 15 years ago. But the reality is then that the reason I got interested in Genesis in the first place is that, as I put it 
in the introduction to my commentary. Genesis is an inheritance which belongs to humanity as a whole. There is a single factor to Genesis that is wider than church or cult. Genesis continues to point human beings towards the eternal dimension which underpins all of human existence to challenge us to ask the fundamental questions about the origin and the meaning of life. That is, in effect, what I found myself seeking to do in the Lent book. I was honoured to be asked by churches together in Britain and Ireland to write their Lent course for 2020. Probably so because normally the task of writing it is given to a group rather than an individual. When I was invited I was initially told that the Roman Catholic Church in England and Wales were keeping 2020 as the year of the word with a special focus on the Bible. I suspect that was partly why I was invited, because as my friends know, I, at heart, I really enjoy exploring the Bible. But there was no other specific advice as to, do, as to what the theme should be. Sometimes having such freedom can feel difficult. One doesn't know where to start. At one point, I thought of writing a course called Treasures Old and New, in which participants would be invited to explore several acts aspects of church life and society today and reflect on how we need both the old and the new. Take worship for example, there are surely treasures we value in traditional worship but there are also insights we can gain from modern ways of celebrating our faith. I thought we might look at tech topics such as worship, scripture, music, our responsibility for society for example through that particular lens. The trouble was that I thought it was a very worthy topic, but I couldn't, it, 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 it could come over as a bit didactic and dull. It doesn't somehow make my own heart zing. And if it didn't zing me as the writer, I wondered what it would do for the readers and users. And then one day, just over a year ago, I was having a conversation with a young man to whom I was acting as a theological mentor in the Diocese of Europe. He was on what is called the Ministry Experience Scheme, which allows young people who are exploring the possibility of ordination to spend a year in one of the chaplaincies of our diocese. This particular person was working in the Anglican chaplaincy in Lyon, not far from Geneva, where I spend some of my time because of my recent work for the World Council of Churches. So we were having a discussion about a study group that he was organising for the young people of the chaplaincy that took the story of the road to Emmaus as a starting point. It's a biblical passage that is especially dear to me and I'm sure to many others of you. John T had had uh, base the study group around significant sentences in that story of Jesus. Their eyes were kept from recognising him. They stood there looking sad. We had hoped that he was to be the one to redeem Israel. Were not our hearts burning within us while he was opening the scriptures to us? And when John T, for, for that is his name, mentioned those last two, a light bulb in my mind went ping. Churches together in Britain and Ireland had asked me to write a Lent course that engaged with the Bible. What better way of engaging with scripture could there be than by asking everyone, what passage of scripture makes your heart burn within you? And that's exactly how the concept of the course began. And when I shared the idea with the staff of Churches Together, they were kind enough to be very enthusiastic about it. The title of the course comes from that musing of the Emmaus Road, disciples who had marvelled about how their hearts burned when Jesus opened the scriptures to them. And as I comment in the course material, there is clearly intended to be a connection between Jesus opening the scriptures and the opening of the disciples' own eyes to see at last who their travelling companion really was. One of the first things I did then 
was to put a message on my Facebook page asking any of my friends who wished to let me know what passage or story of scripture made their hearts burn within them. And the enthusiasm and the number of those who responded certainly made me feel that we had indeed touched on a topic that many people could resonate with. I still remember the very first response that was made by Louis Darrant, a youngish priest who I know who is chaplain to the Anglican community on Costa Hazar in Spain. Louis wrote just the words, supposing him to be the gardener. It is, of course, a quote from the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John. And the meaning between Jesus and the, re the resurrected Jesus and Mary in the garden. Before Mary realised just who Jesus is, in the midst of her tears, she assumes that the figure beside her is the gardener. It's a wonderful verse which catches so many threads of scripture in such a small space. The interplay between God's mysterious elusiveness and God's gracious presence with humanity. The reminder of the Garden of Eden and the great theme, especially of the Gospel of John, that in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, God is inaugurating a new creation. And then it runs the gamut of those emotions like weeping and joy, which are so much part of the story of Scripture, and encourages us also to reflect on love and sacrifice as being at the heart. Of the biblical story. After Louis had offered his first suggestion, the floodgates seemed to open, and I was so grateful to my Facebook friends for being willing to share their own specially cherished passages. Most of them eventually found their way into the list given in one or other chapter of the study course, so you can read them there. At this point in time, I cannot quickly remember who suggested what. But what I do recall is that several people suggested as their special passage one or other of the moments, for there are many, when God speaks to human beings and says, Fear not, for I am with you. God's assurance, fear not, is indeed one of the most frequently used short sentences in Scripture. It's something that's probably helpful for all of us to recall in these difficult days. But of course, the course needed to offer a bit more than giving people the opportunity to share their own heart burning passages. The Lent course is normally run for five weeks, though I hope that we kept managed to keep the thread of heart burning passages running throughout. But gradually the shape of the course came to me, perhaps as I reflected on the variety of biblical passages that had been suggested to me setting them alongside the great overarching themes of scripture that have resonated with me through my years of learning and teaching biblical studies. Indeed, they seem to somehow coalesce together in that wonderful biblical verse that Louis Darren had initially suggested, supposing him to be the gardener. For each week, I tried to offer a variety of resources, taking a key Old Testament passage each time as my starting point, including art, music, poetry and prayer, and the opportunity for discussion and reflection, as well as some of my thoughts on the biblical passage and how we can read it alongside relevant New Testament counterparts. As I go through the various weeks in the next few minutes, I have asked that as I refer to each week in turn, the relevant piece of art for that week will appear on your screen. So I began by reflecting on the great biblical theme of God's elusiveness, God's holiness, which human beings need to hold in honour. What can at see times seem like God's absence? Perhaps it was not the most obvious of starting points, but I chose it partly because at the beginning of Lent, it is a time when we are encouraged to think about such themes as we tread with Jesus a path into the wilderness. And of course, it was in the wilderness of Sinai that Moses first came across the burning bush. 
But it is also there that God reveals his name and his identity as the mysterious I am who I am, the one who refuses to become simply a puppet for humanity. And I believe that that understanding of the elusiveness of God is a theme that runs through scripture. It is also a theme, if I can be bold enough to say this to a congregation in Wales, that is beloved of your great poet, R.S. Thomas, whose poetry is quoted twice in this first week of the course. But I wanted to balance that with the reality of God's presence, both in creation and <coughs> in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, who is presented in the gospel as the culmination of creation. As I expressed in the reflection for this week, the word glory is important here. The Hebrew word that we translate as glory, kavod, comes from a verbal root which originally meant to be weighty or heavy. By circuitous process, glory then came to be understood as a person's, or ultimately God's, visible presence, what gave them their weight, their importance. So when the Bible speaks of creation showing the glory of God, somehow it is implying that in creation we can see God being visibly present with us. I love the picture illustrating the narrative of Genesis 1, which is offered by the St John's Bible. The, the gold drops that increase, the gold dots that increase as we, as, as the day, that increase in strength as the days of creation gradually unfurl, give an impression of God's glory, God's visible presence, becoming more and more obvious as creation concludes in the Sabbath. And of course, as the Course suggests, the language of glory is revisited in the New Testament and especially in the Gospel of John. Only now it is given a double twist. But when John 1.14 proclaims the word became flesh, and we have seen his glory. We are being told that, amazingly, in this person, Jesus Christ, we can actually see God visibly present. And then the additional twist is that as the gospel develops, we find ourselves being told that the hour is coming when the Son of Man will be glorified. And we also hear that then that that hour is the time of Christ's crucifixion. So what the Gospel writer is seeking to tell us is that it is the moment of Jesus' apparent supreme weakness and vulnerability, the hour that he hangs on the cross, that that is the time when amazingly he makes God most visibly present to us. This radical message, which is at the heart of the Christian faith, turns upside down our traditional understandings of the nature of divine power. It then seemed right, after thinking about God's absence and presence, to explore what the Bible has to say about the face of God. It's a phrase that's at the very heart of biblical spirituality. It reminds us of the essentially personal nature of God and of the depth of the relationship between God and human beings. The icon that I hope you have on your screens now, Christ is our reconciliation, is a reminder of this, though it's not immediately obvious. The central th scene of the icon shows the reconciliation of the two brothers, Jacob and Esau, after the, their 20 year long years of hostility, alienation and separation. The key, though, to understanding the story are the words which, according to Genesis 33, Jacob greets his brother when they finally meet again. To see you is like seeing the face of God with such graciousness you have received me. It's a powerful statement of the biblical vision that it is our task as human beings created in the image of God to see and affirm the image or the face of God each other. One of the intriguing aspects of the icon is the depiction of the ladder which rises from earth to heaven, which actually in the story of Genesis appears in a completely different chapter. 
For the message that I believe that it is seeking to convey is that it is only when we can see the face of God in our brothers and sisters that the ladder can act as a bridge to span the chasm between earth and heaven. In the fourth week, I slightly changed the tempo and the pace of the study course, in part, but not only, because it was close to Mothering Sunday, and the visual focus was then on two pictures of women who seemed between them to represent the gamut of human emotions. There is the wonderful exuberance of the dancing Madonna, though the story behind the sculpting of this statue contains great, deep sorrow as well as joy. You can read about it in the Lent course. And then there is this other picture, the old woman, which is a picture which my husband and I own personally, which Alan bought in northern Cyprus just before the Turkish invasion of 1974, which then travelled back to Lebanon with him, where it lived in our apartment through many of the years of the civil war and the first couple of months of the Israeli invasion of 1982, and then was personally carried by us in our, in our own arms across the rocks of Juni Harbour, Juni Beach, when during the invasion, we eventually took a ship back to Cyprus. The old lady in this picture seems both sorrowful and wise. and She represents for us many of the women of the Middle East, who often bear a disproportionate amount of the suffering of their communities. Appropriately in this week, I also explored the biblical language of heart, hopefully in a way that helped to remind people that such language is also applied in the Bible to God himself. And in the fifth week of the course, we focused on the story of the near sacrifice of Isaac. One of the insights that I myself gleaned from my work on the course as it progressed was the fact that the first time that the actual word love appears in the Bible is in Genesis 22, at the beginning of this story of Abraham and Isaac. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, even Isaac, and go sacrifice him on a mountain that I will show you. I did not pretend, because I refused to pretend, it is not an extremely difficult story for readers of the Bible, both ancient and modern. I certainly find it difficult myself. But I hinted at the way that the motif of love which it introduces is picked up and eventually dominates the Gospel, especially the Gospel of John, which presents the death of Jesus as a supreme example of the love of God, both Father and Son. That is surely a message for us to take with us as we travel into Holy Week. I said some minutes ago that Lent courses traditionally run over the five weeks of Lent. Occasionally they take one forward into Holy Week and beyond. Eventually, quite late in the day of my writing, I decided to offer some pictures and reflection for Holy Week. I won't speak about that in detail now, because actually, since the book is available online um, as, a, as, as a free downloadable uh, resource, I want to encourage you to read it for yourself in the week that is shortly beginning. It feels right somehow to ask you to make that journey for yourself in the coming days. I will say that what I try to convey partly with the help of the, stunning of the picture of a stunning stained glass window that depicts the ideas of the 17th century priest and poet Thomas Beherd. But I am seeking to share how Jesus will experience, first of all, on the night of Gethsemane, and then on the next day, the day of his death, that he has become a channel, the stem of a tree, if you like, which will draw to himself all those diverse elements of absence and presence of God's relationship with humanity and human beings' relationship with one another that we discovered in our journey of opening the scriptures. Through Jesus and through his sacrifice, they will be transfigured into something rich and strange, 
so that we meet them and can meet them as they flower again on the other side of his resurrection. The picture is intended to illustrate Traherne's words. The cross is a tree set on fire with invisible flame, which illumineth all the world. The flame is love. And then, finally, and briefly, the book returns to the story of the mess. And appropriately, I believe, ends with a prayer, which, with which I also will conclude now. Jesus, our way, strange storyteller who has become for us the story, living word through whom the eternal God shines out. Meet us face to face this Easter tide. Stay with us and open for us the scriptures. Illumine our eyes and set our hearts on fire so that with you as companion on our journey, with joy we will be able to dis enable to discover that the key to unlock this mysterious library is always love. Amen.